Across the country, state, local, and federal governments depend on annual estimates to direct billions of dollars in spending to help the homeless. But according to reporting by the Washington Post, many advocates and public officials say these estimates are best guesses compiled using methods that are inadequate. Meanwhile, New York Mayor Eric Adams has declared his campaign to move homeless people out of the city's subway system is complete. But some workers have called Adams' claims crazy, saying overnight homelessness is down, but the problem hasn't gone away. And in San Francisco, some businesses say they won't pay taxes until the city takes real action when it comes to tackling the homelessness problem. So what's the answer? Joining us now to weigh in is Donald Whitehead, Jr., executive director of the National Coalition for the Homeless, and Michael Schellenberger, author of Apocalypse Never and San Fran Sixo. Welcome to you both. Thank you for having me. So, Donald, help us understand what exactly is going on in New York with Eric Adams. He has removed the homeless population on the city subways. Where have they gone to? What's the long-term solution there? So, um, not um, certain what the long-term solution um, is, and, and I do think that um, we uh, have not really charted a course that ends homelessness. So. What happens constantly in some of the, our major cities is that people are moved from place to place, and it really actually exacerbates the problem. Um, when you take a person who's kind of taken root in a community and then you move them to another location, never truly ending their homelessness, it actually um, really actually does not do anything that's helpful. It's actually harmful. It ruins relationships that have been created over a period of time. It, it creates a gap in the public trust that's been created between that person experiencing homelessness and the homeless provider system. Uh, many federal dollars are, are frankly just wasted because of it. So I'm not sure that moving people is ever the right solution. Um, it just creates more problems, uh, and none of that ever actually ends homelessness. So if you take a person from the subway and you put them in an encampment, it hasn't ended homelessness. It's just moved it to another place. Michael, what about you? I know you're a critic of a, a lot of the approaches that um, I think Democratic-led municipalities have taken. And, you know, we all know the problem, those of us who live in cities. I, we're here in Washington, D.C. I've seen, it looks to me, the homelessness problem getting a lot worse, a lot more tent cities over time, uh, a lot more obvious mental illness in the streets. Uh, you've written a lot about the problem in California. What is being done that's wrong and what should be done instead? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the first thing you have to do is to distinguish between two groups of, of people we call homeless. The first are people that are sheltered homeless, people that are in shelters or in permanent supportive housing. And then there's people that are homeless that are living on the streets or on sidewalks or in alleyways. Those are, those are folks that we call unsheltered homeless. There's been a big divergence in how different cities treat these two populations. New York traditionally has sheltered somewhere between 96 and 99 percent of its homeless, whereas in West Coast cities, we've sheltered somewhere closer to a third. So the homeless problem in the West Coast that you've, that's been so dramatic in the last decade has been of the unsheltered. Um, I have to disagree with uh, Donald on this issue. The data is very clear now. We've seen that uh, unsheltered homeless die at a rate three times higher than sheltered homeless do. This is now confirmed by multiple studies, including the most recent mortality data from New York City and Los Angeles between 2020 and 2021. Three times more people, three times more people experiencing homelessness died in Los Angeles than died in New York, even though there are 14,000 fewer homeless people in Los Angeles. We also saw a major cohort study covering a, a single group of people over 10 years in Boston which found the identical numbers, three times more people died when unsheltered than when sheltered. So this idea that we should leave people unsheltered, that there's something wrong with moving people, that there's something wrong with shutting down homeless encampments, that's, just, that's debunked by this data. In fact, it's been debunked for several decades. There's a long body of research showing it's dangerous for people to live outside. The intuitive sense that there's something wrong with letting people sleep outside, eat outside, defecate outside, use drugs publicly, 
That is correct. You are right to think there's something wrong with that. It's bad for the folks that are living in that situation. The vast majority of whom suffer from uh, addiction and or mental illness. But it's also bad for the society. It's bad for the fabric of society to see our fellow citizens treated and maybe second because um, you've just been given uh, a really false narrative about the issue of homelessness. So we're not saying people should sleep outside. What we're saying is that if you move people who are outside, unsheltered, as you said, from one place to another, you're still leaving people outside. That's the issue. It's not whether or not um, we should be housing people. Everybody, nobody in the world would think that the right idea wouldn't be to house people. We're saying that if you take a person from the subway and you take them to a encampment, that's not making them, that's not taking them out of homelessness. They're still unsheltered, Mr. Schellenberg. I, that's the, the point I'm trying to make. I agree on that. Is the idea is that we should put them into housing. We don't have enough housing in this country. We should put people in permanent supportive housing. You mentioned that. It has a 90% success rate across the country. So instead of taking that person from the subway and putting them into another encampment, we should be putting them into permanent supportive housing. That's what we're saying. What we're saying is criminalizing people, making people in Tennessee, it's a felony if you're homeless. What does that do to end homelessness? It puts people in the criminal justice system, which exacerbates the issue of homelessness. These cities are not coming up with solutions to house people, whether it's permanent supportive housing or shelter. What they're saying is we're going to move you to another location. You're still going to be homeless, and we haven't done anything to solve the issue. So we're saying solve the issue. I agree with you, people are dying on the street. That's why we need more permanent housing. That's why we need more affordable housing. That's why we need jobs that pay a livable wage. Just talking about it and yelling at people and moving them along does nothing to change that. It it's actually a- restarts the issue of getting them housed. They've been contacted by workers paid by the federal government. And then you move them someplace where nobody knows where they are. And the process starts over again. And it's people that make these false narratives all the time, manipulate statistics and and give this false narrative that is causing harm to people and causing people to die on the streets. So Michael, let's let's talk about this a little bit because I also didn't necessarily see where what you offered uh, co- contradicted uh, what Donald had said initially. But what do you say to folks who Obviously, everyone, I think, is united in wanting people to have permanent ho- housing for people who need mental health care to get mental health care. In New York, uh, one out of every 10 children in public schools experiences homelessness in the course of the year. I mean, this is a largely sympathetic population, despite how it's often framed in the media. We've been talking about the homeless problem throughout, but it seems like the problem for most of the people who are talking about it is the optics of homelessness as opposed to the investment in getting people who are having to live on the street, not that they want to live on the street. How? So what is the solution in your mind to resolving the underlying issues here? Yeah, I mean, the, the difference is, is that traditionally, and I can't speak for my co-panelist, um, but traditionally, advocates, so-called advocates for the homeless have opposed requiring people living on the streets to go into shelters rather than wait for housing. So. There's this idea that somehow everybody that lives on the street should have their own apartment unit. That's called housing first or this demand for permanent supportive housing. That's not how New York got 96 to 99 percent of its homeless population sheltered. New York had people required people to stay in shelters. Um, in California, the reason there's so many people on the street is that they've held up the they've made the perfect the better than than the good demanding that everybody have their own apartment unit rather than going into shelters. And that's been unsafe for people. So we agree that everybody needs to come inside. I'm saying you can't wait until you have an apartment unit for every single person that wants one on the street. In fact, we know that just giving apartment units to people that are suffering from um, addiction and mental illness often makes the problem worse. Uh, What we know works is something called contingency management, which is that people, uh, they get shelter and then they earn housing as a uh, incentive 
for getting off drugs, taking their psychiatric meds, getting reaffiliated with family and friends. That's called contingency management. That's what they do all over the world. That's what I saw work in the Netherlands. That's what they do in Portugal, Japan. There's a tiered system. The biggest study ever done was done in Birmingham, Alabama, where uh, crack addicts were in shelters and then they earned housing when they passed a drug test. And then they would, if they failed it, they would go back to shelter, not to the street, back to shelter. So housing's a reward for good behavior, but everybody has to come inside into the shelter. That's the basic social contract. I think that's what taxpayers expect, but there's been a small group of people who've been very loud voices who've said, no, you can't make anybody go inside unless you have their own apartment for them. That hasn't worked, and that's the reason why you have so many people on the street well, in the West Coast. And that comports Coast. with what I've seen in D.C., the efforts to move people from the encampments, from the tents, from the living under bridges uh, into, into apartments is something that D.C. does offer. There's a lot of difficulty in, in first actually persuading the people living in the tents under the bridges um, to, to go along with that, and then a huge problem when they're actually in the apartment if their underlying addiction or mental health issues haven't been addressed, then they essentially don't stay in the apartment or they, they, they bring the kind of street behavior to the apartment and they get kicked out of the apartment. So, so, right. so Donald, I want to bring you back into the conversation. It, you know, what about what Michael said and what I've said, are, do, you, do you disagree with, if anything? agree with probably a hundred percent of that. Um, I've been doing work on homelessness uh, starting in outreach where I went out and actually worked with people on the street for almost 30 years. In that 30 years, I've never heard a person who was homeless say that they didn't want an apartment unit. Uh, they may not go into shelters. We need a lot of work to improve shelters. And one other thing I want to just debunk is that there aren't enough shelters in this country. Right. Not once this entire country has enough shelter for the entire homeless population in their community. Uh, on top of that, uh, housing first is not just housing. It's housing and services to support people's mental health issues, to support substance abuse issues. And it has a 90 percent success rate. So your premise was that people go into housing and they get kicked out. That's just not true. 90% of them stay in their housing for a year. That population that is eligible for what's called permanent supportive housing make up about 10 to 20% of the population. The larger part of the larger portion of the homeless population are people who are episodically homeless. They're homeless for a short period of time and then they move on. So when you create criminalization practices, it not only affects that unsheltered population that uh, the professor talked about before, it affects everybody. So we have people who have worked all their lives and jobs and they don't want to be homeless, they're forced into homelessness. You can't find one person who will be, um, who will tell you that they want to be homeless. It just does not exist. We don't have enough supportive housing. Build Back Better had billions of dollars of affordable housing in it, we didn't pass that. We have a housing problem in this country. It's not a moral issue. And the last time I checked, drug issues, uh, people with substance abuse or behavioral health issues, those are medical conditions. People should not have to earn support to address medical issues. Well, what other medical issue do we do that around? Uh, people do recover from substance abuse and mental health issues. We, we have thousands of examples. They're teachers, they're lawyers, they're PhDs. They got the support they needed, they moved on, and they ended their homelessness. We don't have enough resources in this country to address the structural issues. We have an over-representation of people of color in this population, and we know the issues that, are, that they're facing. Uh, and so the, the myopic solutions that are being talked about now are, are just, uh, they, they fail uh, in, in, in the process of, of logic. It does not make sense to force people in the treatment when only, that only uh, counts for about 10% of the population. It doesn't work. And I'll tell you about New York. He keeps um, quoting New York. You know what's different about New York and Los Angeles? New York has a right to housing. We fought for that. They have a right to shelter. So if you're on the street in New York City, by law, you have to get put in a shelter. There is no right to shelter in Los Angeles. There are, are zoning laws that present, 
prevent low-income housing from being built. We have a gap of about 7 million units. Only a third of the people who have public housing subsidies can actually get into those housing, uh, into that housing because we don't have enough housing. We have oh, what you're saying, you oppose that law requiring the the people on the streets to be in shelters instead? Because I, I, I think uh, Michael was saying that, right, that that's a good intervention that has helped. And I thought you were saying that that was not good. What I said is we should not criminalize people. What people what's happening is people are being arrested for sleeping on the street when there's not enough shelter. Yeah, Michael, they, let me ask you about this, because, you know, there are 24,600 shelter beds in L.A., 24,600. There are estimated to be 41,290 homeless people in L.A. So what do you make of this argument that, I mean, you seem to be saying that people should not be on the street. And again, I think that everyone agrees that that's not a suboptimal condition. But the onus that you seem to be placing is on the individual for not finding shelter that it seems doesn't literally no. exist. And that that's puts not. people in the situation to be criminalized. Uh, per, per Donald's point. So what, what's your response to that? So first of all, the Supreme Court has held that it's illegal to require people to stop sleeping in public if there are no shelter beds. So this issue is now moot. The Supreme Court has upheld the Boise, Idaho decision that says that you cannot make people stop sleeping in public unless you have shelter beds for them. So in it my was book, criminalized Francisco, and was recently over that, man, that decision man, was man, recently. Man. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, in my book, I document in San Francisco that, in fact, advocates, so-called advocates for the homeless on West Coast cities, again, I'm not talking, I don't, know, I don't know Donald or what he's done, but they have opposed funding for shelters to, so that that money would go to housing, which is much more expensive and takes much longer to build. And so as a result, the U.S. government's housing um, and urban development uh, department finds that New York City has 69,000 shelter beds, while Los Angeles has 17,000, okay? Even though, uh, it, it's, but that explains the difference. Um, New York has 38,000 housing beds. LA has 38,000 housing beds. So the difference is not between the number of housing beds or housing units for the homeless. It's the difference between the number of shelter beds. New York has... Um, 52,000 more shelter beds than LA. That is what explains why there are so many more people on the street in LA. Why doesn't LA have enough shelter beds? Because the Board of Supervisors and the City Council have opposed building more shelters out of this idea that really what you have to do is give everybody their own apartment unit. That's proven to be so grossly unrealistic um, it would take literally centuries to build enough housing units to supply all the demand. And that assumes that you wouldn't get more people entering into homelessness to get the housing units. Now, in terms of the issue of what works, we know that there was a study by Harvard medical um, scientists in 2021, published just last year, and it found that just 12% of the homeless who received permanent supportive housing remained housed after a decade. And the reason is, and there's a large body of research on this, is that if you don't deal with the underlying drug addiction or mental illness problems, then people will end up becoming homeless again. It's a tragedy. We should not want that to occur. So the rhetoric is, well, of course, you have to have the support there. But that support, when you're dealing with people suffering from addiction or mental illness, means that there has to be a requirement that they go inside because there's a lot of people. I mean, I'm shocked. I've, I've interviewed a lot of people when you say, would you consider going inside, you know, for your own safety? They say, no, I'm fine right here. That's the addiction talking or the mental illness talking. And so what you need is to make the housing contingent. It needs to, you, everyone should get shelter, just to be clear, we're talking about two separate things, shelter, basic clean shelter, and then housing. Everybody should get shelter. That's the law. That's, that's a moral fundamental issue. We all agree on that. But housing should be earned. That's how it works in the Netherlands. That's how it works in Portugal. That's how it works in Japan. That's how it works all over the world. And the reason is, is that you have to give people an incentive, a reason to get into recovery because often addiction is so powerful and so is untreated mental illness in a different mechanism. But nonetheless, it's so powerful that people have to have a reason to get recovery and that's what housing allows. So what Michael, we're, I don't know if we're disagreeing, I'm just saying shelter yeah. needs to be based but Housing. I think we're a little bit talking past each other. And I just want to nail a couple of things down, if I may. 
it, are treatment programs available for everyone who has an addiction issue? No. Is, okay, so, so this seems to me to be the problem. I think that most people would be okay with the idea of some kind of, you know, uh, the, the, the best level of housing reserved for people who have gone through some kind of treatment if it were the case that treatment were actually available for everybody, if, if, the, if the shelter system actually had beds for everybody, which it doesn't, if the shelter system was humane and not a place where people quite reasonably might not want to go because they face different kinds of dangers there, they're subject to their belongings being taken by other residents. These are the kinds of stories that I've heard as I've read about this issue. So it does feel a little bit like an unnecessary antagonism as we're trying to figure out and untangle what is a legitimate problem that is driven by a lack of social support services and a lack of housing, both shelter housing and I think there is a long-term need to build more permanent housing, not just for the uh, homeless population, frankly, but there's a housing crisis more broadly in the United States of America. So should the question we should both be asking be, why there isn't more funding for all of these programs that I think everyone here agrees are necessary from one degree to another. I'll let you weigh in on this, Donald. My, my point is that it, it isn't myopic solutions that'll change the dynamic of how many people are homeless in this country. It's addressing those structural issues. The lack of mental health treatment since deinstitutionalization, the, the lack of support for people with substance abuse issues, that's getting better. Uh, after the opioid crisis, but not there by a long shot. All of those people need housing as well. Uh, people leaving the foster care system, uh, being emancipated. These are large issues that are not being addressed. The idea of putting people in congregate, shelter, congregate shelters uh, at mass, uh, there's a movement away from that because of what we found during COVID. It's not a healthy situation to pack people into shelters uh, in a congregate setting. What we need is housing. What we need is people having the ability. Housing should be a human right in this country. And, you know, our, our guest keeps quoting the Netherlands. Guess what happens in the Netherlands? They've signed on to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which grants a right to housing. And the only country that has it is, you guessed it, the United States of America. If we had a right to housing, if we build enough housing, we could solve homelessness tomorrow. Homelessness is solvable. We just have to point it in the right directions. We can't just pump people into shelters. And, and one thing I'll say about shelters that I hope everybody realizes is that a shelter is not a home. If you're in a shelter, you're still homeless. We're looking for solutions that end homelessness. Um, it's not just about emptying the streets so it's not, not a blight on some elected official. It's about real solutions. And so the, the solutions that I've heard today, um, we all want to get people off the street, but we want to do it in a way that helps them with their quality of life. It moves people on. That Harvard statistic, um, you should also know that one of the goals when people get into permanent housing is for them to move on to other kinds of housing, not to stay in that housing with services forever, to start to heal themselves and get back into the normal flow of society. And it happens all the time. And, and I'm, I, I'm not saying this because um, I've read a study from Harvard. I actually was homeless myself. Uh, since then, I've won an Emmy. Um, I've been able to provide housing for other people. And that happens every day. I have a woman who was on the streets of DC for most of her life. Uh, two years ago, she graduated from Georgetown University. She's now started her own business. If we care for people, if we do this in a compassionate way and we provide those structural issues and the structural changes that are necessary, we can solve this problem tomorrow. We just have to be willing to do it in a loving, caring way. Michael, I want to give you the last word here. Look, I would like to build more housing uh, for a variety of reasons, a lower housing costs for everyone. Uh, my understanding and from looking at this is that uh, part of the difficulty is regulatory, is, is local uh, and, you know, neighborhood associations fighting uh, redevelopment, fighting, you know, t tearing down old buildings, building new ones. Um, I, I, I think I agree with uh, with what Donald was saying that you know if we ideally we should absolutely have more housing uh, but but that's a hard thing to I mean California has had a, a lot of trouble right uh, building just housing in general for any reason let alone for the homeless yeah I mean look we need more housing there's not enough housing I think everybody agrees on that I've been an advocate for housing for a long time 
But if we're talking about how to deal with this so-called homeless crisis, we know what works. It's the same thing that works everywhere in the world is that you need everybody to come inside because if people are outside, they die at a rate three times higher than when they're inside. That when they come inside, they're going to come inside and they have a right, an absolute moral and legal and constitutional right to safe, clean and basic shelter. And that's it. And then beyond that, if they want to get into recovery, then I think there is um, a good reason for taxpayers to subsidize housing for them. But if you'll notice what Donald was doing here, and it's very typical with, with so-called advocates for the homeless, they mix these things up. People have a right to clean, basic, safe shelter. They do not have a right to their own apartment unit in the most expensive real estate markets in the United States. We can't afford to just do that, particularly because it actually makes people's addiction and mental illness worse when you just give them an apartment as a reward for being homeless because they're so sick. In fact, you have to give the, the housing must be reserved for the people that are on a path to recovery. If you are giving housing to people because they are sick with addiction and mental illness, you will make them more sick. You will make them more mentally ill. That is the experience of Los Angeles and San Francisco. And this fantasy that if you give people an apartment, if you give an apartment to people who are sick with mental illness and addiction, that they will then miraculously recover on their own by offering but group Michael therapy like, I don't know that and buprenorphine, that's deeply irresponsible. And that's I, I, why we've had the chaos on the street. So it has to be contingent. It's called contingency management. It is the most mainstream. It is accepted by the Veterans Affairs. It's accepted by Drug Policy Alliance. Read up on the scientific peer review literature. Contingency management is the most accepted form of treatment for people suffering from drug addiction or mental illness. It's also the right social contract. Taxpayers have an obligation to provide basic clean shelter to our fellow citizens. People do not have a right to their own apartment unit. We're, we do have some need to provide subsidized housing for people who need it. My aunt had schizophrenia. She was in a group home. She did very well. There's some small segment of people that need to live in a group home. There may be some others for whom housing is a reward for progress towards recovery, but giving apartment units to people as a reward for being sick with, with mental illness or addiction and homeless is absolutely the wrong incentive. My, Michael, I this appreciate that, but I'm not sure anybody here is really arguing that. I think we established that there is an effect, an effect, in, in, a, in an actuality, enough support for everyone to get mental well, health. So to then be, to make to be wait, fair, wait, Donald wait just actually, excuse me, but Donald just actually said, he, if you listen to what he said, he said we shouldn't force people into shelters, we shouldn't crowd people into shelters. What? He made it sound like that was somehow inhumane. <laughs> It's more humane to require that people get basic clean shelter and earn their own housing rather than to make them stay on the streets until you can get everybody their own housing, which is what we've done in California and the West Coast. Donna, we should let you respond. With what I said, I said, and you talked about Martin versus Boise. People are violating that. Look, look at the laws that have just been in Tennessee and Missouri. Uh, that is a, a circuit uh, decision that doesn't affect those communities. Uh, in Tennessee, it's now a felony with up to six years in jail for camping outside. In I'm Missouri, against that. They, they're making. I'm not, they're, I'm not defending that. I'm defending what New York that, had been doing. That's the only way you can force people inside is to criminalize them. You're well, forcing. No, them. it's not. I'm people. sorry, that's just not true. Well, well look, I, how well, else can you true. force? Tell me, tell me. I, I shadowed. In. Okay, I shadowed a social. I shadowed social workers in the Netherlands. And I saw them get people inside, and they didn't it's show up. Right to leave, and but they, look, they would I, say. I, they, unfortunately, they, we, we do have to wrap. I do think it's a really interesting question that is being teed up right now. How do you force people inside without there being some, you know, application of police force, which is a, the criminalization that we're talking about. I think that what is yeah. good about this conversation is that we agreed about a lot of the fundamentals, and I look forward to continuing a conversation perhaps with you both about the the strategy and what is needs to be done on a base level in terms of funding and able, in order for us to get to the goals that I think we all share. Thank you to you both, Michael and Donald, for, for joining us today. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Um, I'm very passionate, and I'm sorry if I got a little heated on this issue. No, no, no. Uh, I have heated discussions uh, here all the time. You should see Brianna and I go at it. All right, thank you both so much, and we'll have more rising right after this.